Good afternoon. My name is Graham Betcher and I serve as Executive Director of the Birmingham Museum of Art. I want to thank you for joining me this afternoon for our first live broadcast uh, from our galleries. And I promise I'll get out of the way in a moment so you can see the entire painting, but I just wanted to say a, a few words uh, beforehand. Um, I want to, first of all, um, you know, acknowledge the fact that we are in a, an unusual uh, time for our city, for our community, for our society. Um, many of you, if not most of you, are working um, from home. And it's a particularly unusual time uh, for those of us um, in the cultural sector. Uh, you, our visitors, are the lifeblood of our city's cultural institutions. And for me right now at this moment, it's, it's eerie to sit in our galleries and to be the only soul here at a time when we would normally be filled with visitors. So I wanna thank you um, for choosing to spend a portion of your time uh, with me this afternoon. Uh, we've had a lot of inquiries um, from members of the public asking uh, if there are ways that we can bring a bit of the museum uh, into your homes. Many of you are, are at ho not only working at home, but have your children uh, at home and are looking for uh, ways to uh, fill their days, not only with uh, educational enrichment, but entertainment. And so I'm hoping that these regular broadcasts from the gallery uh, can provide uh, some of both. Uh, we will be, I'll try to broadcast as much as, as possible. Um, our next scheduled broadcast will be on Saturday at 2 p.m. Uh, I'll be talking about another favorite of mine, uh, Dixon or Miriam Peel. Um, but uh, today I thought we'd start off, and this is by popular request, uh, with a longtime favorite uh, in the museum's collection, namely Albert Bierstadt's Looking Down Yosemite Valley, California, uh, which was painted in 1865. Um, just a little uh, footnote uh, before uh, I show you the painting in its entirety. Um, I'm not a cameraman. I'm a total amateur when it comes to this. Uh, and I'm using whatever equipment I could find uh, without most of our uh, staff being here to help me locate things. And so uh, please bear with me. I'll do my best. I think I'm going to try to invest in a, in a tripod uh, so that you won't have to, uh, have to deal with my, my shaky hands. Thank God I'm, I'm just an art historian and not a, a surgeon. So um, with that, uh, bear with me just a moment and we're going to look at the, the painting itself. Okay, here we go. So Albert Bierstadt's Looking Down Yosemite Valley, California, as I said, was painted in 1865. Uh, Albert Bierstadt first went west in the 1850s, 1859 be, to be precise, but he didn't encounter the Yosemite Valley uh, until a visit in 1863. Um, he was immediately overwhelmed by the tremendous splendor of the location, the rock formations, the golden light uh, streaming through the valley. valley. It was really, a, to him, uh, the closest one could come to paradise uh, in this country. And so it's not surprising that Bierstadt then made this the subject of many, many of his subsequent works. Uh, using the sketches that he made in 1863, he went back to his studio in the Northeast uh, and began working on paintings of what he had witnessed at the Yosemite Valley. This one wasn't completed until 1865. And it's important for a couple of reasons. Um, one, this is Albert Bierstadt's uh, first monumental view of the Yosemite Valley. In the 19th century, paintings like this of the American West that were painted on a grand scale were um, something very close to uh, public spectacles. In fact, uh, artists even charge admission to see paintings like this when they were on view. Not only was a uh, Bierstadt painting pictures like this, uh, but his contemporaries Frederick Edwin Church, uh, uh, Thomas Moran, and others were painting uh, these massive views of the American West and also other 
uh, other uh, new and interesting locales, uh, such as uh, the mountains uh, of the Andes in South America, which is what church became known for. But Bierstadt is mo most closely associated with uh, the American West and with the Yosemite Valley in particular. The second reason why this painting is uh, important and remarkable is because it has one of the most unique and storied uh, provenances uh, or history of ownership uh, of nearly any painting in our collection, and I would chance to say of any American painting anywhere. It was unveiled by Bierstadt in April of 1865. And so that said, those of you who uh, have you know, studied your American history know that this is in the, um, the final days of the Civil War. Uh, and it's because of that fact that scholars have often interpreted this painting through the lens of the Civil War. Um, in fact, the unveiling of this painting uh, in New York at the National Academy of Design had to be both postponed by several weeks because of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln on April 15th, 1865. Now, when it finally did go on view at the National Academy of Design, it wasn't an immediate success. Um, interestingly, one of the critics, I believe a critic for the New York Time, didn't, Times didn't so much deal with the painting itself, but rather he remarked on the frame. And to be sure, the frame is quite unique. This is the original frame. It is made of solid walnut, and it weighs over 200 pounds. It's a massive frame. But what sets it apart from other frames of the period is the fact that it is not a uh, heavily gilded frame. It has just a, a, a very modest gilded liner, but it shows the natural wood. And for that reason, the critic from the New York Times remarked that it uh, was really more of the, the carpenter's art than the frame maker's art. Now, I, I think that Bierstadt made a very wise choice personally framing it the way he did, um, because the, uh, why, why would an artist want a frame to compete with an already golden painting? Uh, the light of the sunset is absolutely drenching the Yosemite Valley, so why would one need gold leaf uh, to compete with what Bierstadt is trying to do, which is depict nature in all its glory? Now, from the 1865 exhibition, um, it was sold. It was sold to a businessman uh, the following year, a Chicago businessman who had the name of Uranus H. Crosby. Mr. Crosby made his fortune in the liquor distilling business. And in, in fact, uh, he was a successful businessman, well, to a point, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, but he was also a great lover of arts and culture. He built the most lavish opera house that Chicago had ever seen, Crosby's Opera House. And on top of that, inside of the opera house, he built a glorious picture gallery and filled it with works by all the leading American artists of the day. This was the crown jewel of his collection. He paid $20,000 for this painting in 1866, which made it, at the time, the most expensive single work ever sold by a living American artist. 1866, $20,000. I think those of you who follow the art market these days and see the, the you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars that contemporary works are going for um, probably find that quite curious that this at $20,000 um, was the most expensive uh, painting by a contemporary artist in the country in 1866. So Mr. Crosby hung this painting in his, in his opera house, but then um, trouble struck. Mr. Crosby, though he was a successful businessman, um, he loved to spend money. He loved to spend money more quickly than he could make it. And because he had the goal of making his opera house and his art collection among the most significant in the country, um, he borrowed a great deal of money from other local businessmen and other to make, in order to make this possible. Uh, his creditors came calling and he said, you know, buddy, it's time to pay up. You're building this lavish opera house, you've bought all these paintings, and we have not seen any repayment of your loans or any return on our investments. 
Well, unfortunately, Mr. Crosby um, was flat broke. He had nothing except for his assets uh, to, uh, to uh, show for himself. But he had a really ingenious idea. He printed up lottery tickets, thousands of lottery tickets, each bearing the likeness of honest Abraham Lincoln. And he sold those lottery tickets for $5 a piece to individuals in every state and every territory uh, in the country at that time. It was a huge success. Now, what was the lottery for? Was it for a cash prize? No, because Mr. Crosby had no cash to give. The lottery was for the opera house itself. That was grand prize. Second prize was this painting, Bierstadt's Looking Down the Yosemite. Third, fourth, fifth prize, all the way, I think there were 125 different prizes that are thereabouts, were all the other paintings in his collection. And just for paying $5, everyone walked away a winner because people could cash in their $5 lottery ticket for an engraving of an original work in the collection if they weren't lucky enough to win a painting themselves. It was a huge success. Crosby made tens of thousands of dollars from the sale of these lottery tickets. In fact, it was such a, such a success that newspapers nationwide uh, reported on uh, Crosby's lottery, and Harper's Weekly even sent an artist to do an illustration of drawing day, the day at the Opera House when the lots were drawn for the successful winners. Now, the day came, and the Opera House was won by a farmer from rural Illinois. He had no interest in owning an Opera House, and so what did Mr. Crosby do? He immediately took the money he had made from the sale of the tickets and bought the Opera House back. Curiously, Mr. Crosby held on to the winning ticket for the Bierstadt. He said that it had never been sold, and therefore unsold tickets remained with the house. And then finally, all of the other paintings in his collection were distributed, but at that time, most people were interested in having cash money instead of a painting. And because the lottery had been such a success, not only was Mr. Crosby able to pay off all of his creditors, he bought back the Opera House and he bought back nearly all of the other paintings that had been distributed and had a little uh, profit left over to boot. An ingenious scheme. He was out absolutely nothing and profited greatly. Well, you can imagine um, legislatures throughout the country immediately enacted state laws to prevent such a scheme from ever happening again in this country. But uh, Mr. Crosby got off scot-free. He also made an important decision that he would get out of the opera business. I think he had learned his lesson. He had a, a cousin who was a partner in his liquor distilling, distilling business, a man named Albert Crosby, and he sold the opera house and the collection, lock, stock, and barrel, to Cousin Albert. Now, I wish I could say that Cousin Albert were, was better uh, at managing his money. Um, that seems not to have been the case. No sooner did he purchase the opera house, which was nearly brand new, uh, from his cousin Uranus Crosby, did Albert start to renovate the uh, opera house? Well, um, things were going along pretty well with the renovations uh, until October of 1871, and then something really, really terrible happened in the city of Chicago, which I think all of you know, or most of you know where this is leading, the Great Chicago Fire. Crosby's Opera House was utterly laid to ruin. In fact, uh, national magazines ran before and after images, engravings showing the lavish Opera House and the pile of rubble that, that remained behind after it completely went up in flames. How did this painting survive the Great Chicago Fire? Well, fortunately, the night that the fire uh, started, they were getting ready for a grand reopening the following day in the Opera House, which means they had all manner of draft horses, wagons, stagehands who were hauling, um, hauling uh, props, uh, sets, 
uh, tables, chairs, dishes, everything that they would need for their lavish grand reopening. The fire started far enough away from Crosby's Opera House that they were able to uh, they were able to detect it. And the house manager for the Opera House uh, yelled for everyone to drop what they were doing and start pulling the paintings off the wall and getting them um, to safety uh, on the opposite side of town. And so that's exactly what happened. Now, interestingly, there was a, a vestige of the Great Chicago Fire that we discovered recently. Not long ago, this painting traveled to the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, for an exhibition on uh, American art and the Civil War. And we decided to have a local uh, furniture conservator named Magali Mouse uh, work on this frame and, and clean it up uh, in order for its star turn uh, at the Smithsonian. Um, and Magali uh, reached out to us and said, has this painting uh, or has this frame been in a house fire? Um, because when I'm cleaning it, I'm detecting smoke. Uh, and in all likelihood, uh, she activated or reactivated a micro layer of soot um, from the Great Chicago Fire. Um, can't say for certain, but that's one uh, possible explanation. So how does this painting um, relate to the Civil War? Um, because I mentioned this was in this important exhibition at the Smithsonian. Because this painting was painted in the final uh, final months of the Civil War and exhibited uh, shortly after Abraham Lincoln's death, uh, many people have interpreted it through the lens of the Civil War. Unlike Albert Bierstadt's other views of the Yosemite Valley, um, it, it, it seems to be completely devoid of animal or human life. Um, that's very different than other paintings where you see individuals, you know, humans in the Yosemite Valley. Um, you see turtles uh, basking on rocks in the sun. Uh, you see uh, all sorts of birds or deer. Uh, and for the longest time, we actually thought that there wasn't any sign of life in this painting. And I'll get to that in just a moment. Scholars have mostly read this as a dead calm at the end of a national catastrophe. But remember that we're looking uh, due west uh, uh, toward the end of the Yosemite Valley. And so the sun sets on one chapter in American history, but what comes uh, with every sunset? Inevitably, a sunrise. So this represents the close in one chapter in American history, but with the promise of a new beginning, a new start um, for our country in the wake of such a, a national um, uh, tragedy as the Civil War. Now, it wasn't, it was just before the exhibition opened at the Smithsonian that I actually got an email from Eleanor Jones Harvey, the exhibition's curator, and at that time, chief curator at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And she said, Graham, we literally had to stop the presses. There is a bird in the painting. And I said, what? <laughs> a bird? I've been over this painting with a fine tooth comb. There's no bird. And she said, oh, yes. There's a bird, and I'm going to see if I can't bring us up close enough now um, to point out the bird. And if I set off the alarm, please forgive me, which I have, you will see, let's see here, perched on the top of this branch, see it at the very end? A little bird. Now you might say, oh, this is where the branch just turns up, but I promise you, that if you see this under magnification, um, you will see that it is a bird, very deliberately painted, not with just with brown paint, but there is blue and red pigment um, present as well. Um, there are different theories as to what kind of bird this is. Um, one of our friends at the Audubon Society believes it's a kingfisher um, and uh, makes a compelling case for that. I personally believe it's a Western bluebird, um, which fits in very nicely with the rest of the narrative, the idea um, that we're looking at a sunset, so uh, with the promise of a new beginning thereafter. And in the 19th century, bluebirds were symbols of hope and renewal because they were associated um, with spring. Um, it's sort of the, the precursor of the uh, Disney version, the bluebird of happiness, uh, so to speak. Um, that said, uh, 
Bierstadt, though he did pay a great deal of attention to the, his natural surroundings, uh, both the landscape and animals, um, he was not a strict adherent uh, to uh, the natural sciences. He was an artist first and foremost and took a lot of liberties um, with what he depicted. Um, and so that's how the painting relates uh, to uh, the Civil War. Now, I want to return uh, for a moment uh, to its remarkable story. So the painting survived the Great Chicago Fire and remained in Albert Crosby's hands. Um, he exhibited it briefly in Chicago after the Great Chicago Fire um, for uh, fundraisers to raise money for fire relief. Um, and then the painting pretty much went off the grid. And uh, the reason why people were curious to, to know what happened to it was not so much that it was a famous painting. That was certainly the case, but that wasn't the primary reason. It had more to do with the fact that like his cousin Albert, or like his cousin Uranus, Albert had also uh, run up a string of debts with local Chicago businessmen who intended to be paid. Problem was they couldn't find the painting and they couldn't find Albert. Both had gone, um, gone missing and, and were nowhere to be found. This group of Chicago businessmen engaged a judge from Indiana um, to try to locate uh, Mr. Crosby uh, and the painting and any other assets he might have. And uh, the, the judge, unfortunately, was coming up cold. He couldn't find any, any trace of Mr. Crosby or his assets, and he'd pretty much all but given up. He decided to take a vacation to Cape Cod um, to visit a colleague, and his colleague suggested that perhaps they might like to visit a local mansion called Tawasentha, um, and because the owners of that mansion had a beautiful picture gallery which they opened to the public certain days of the week. And so the judge and his friend went to Tawasintha and entered the picture gallery, and there the judge, who had visited Crosby's Opera House and knew the painting, saw this very painting, and he said, who did you say owned this mansion? And he said, well, the Crosby family, they're an old local family and they've had a home here for years. And so that was in fact the, the same one and same Crosby family. Uh, while Uranus and Albert Crosby made their fortune in Chicago, they did in fact come from an old Cape Cod family that had a beautiful uh, mansion on the Cape uh, with a formal picture gallery. Well, the judge decided uh, that he would compel uh, Mr. Crosby uh, to return to Chicago and that uh, Mr. Crosby would have to sell all of his assets in order to satisfy his debts. Well, Mr. Crosby, like his cousin, was also very clever, but in a different way. He didn't start a lottery. He, in fact, successfully argued in a court of law that he had no assets to his name, that he had given all of his assets to his wife, and that even to buy a sandwich or a bowl of soup or a, a new shirt, he had to borrow money from his wife. I think it, in those days, there wasn't quite the same notion of community property. And so, in fact, the court uh, found that uh, Mr. Crosby had no means of repaying these debts because he had no assets to his name. That said, Mr. Crosby continued to live in Tawasentha um, with his wife. And that brings us to how we got the painting here in Birmingham. Uh, Mr. Crosby died and left everything to his widow. Uh, I believe her name was uh, Matilda. And uh, they had no children of their own. And in fact, if you believe Mr. Crosby, she already owned everything anyway. She ended up leaving the mansion and its contents, including all of the paintings, to her two nieces. And in 1929, those nieces took the paintings from the picture gallery out to the front lawn of the mansion and decided to have what might be considered the country's best ever yard sale. I, I wish every day that I could have a time machine uh, and go back to 1929 uh, to that yard sale. Well, as luck would have it, a woman from Birmingham uh, named Anna Fries, who was born in Sweden, but lived here in Birmingham, where her husband Elias was the chief engineer for the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, 
Anna Fries happened to be visiting a friend on Cape Cod, and I surmise that that's because her son was living in the area at the time. He was an undergraduate at Harvard. And so Anna Fries, uh, her friend lived just uh, a short distance from the Crosby Mansion, Tawasentha. And so uh, I believe that her friend suggested that they visit this mansion. Um, they discovered the, the sale on the front lawn. And Mrs. Fries, who at that time was um, involved with the, um, the uh, support of the Birmingham Public Library, purchased this painting uh, for the princely sum of $200, 300 if you add in rail freight, and had it shipped to Birmingham. She then gave it anonymously to the Birmingham Public Library, was it where it had been, where it was installed from 1929 onward. Now, typically we like to honor um, the wishes of those who remain, would like to remain anonymous, um, and that was done throughout Anna Fries's lifetime. But I think that her incredible philanthropy to the Birmingham Public Library and later to the Birmingham Museum of Art um, needs to be acknowledged by name. She's given um, our city one of its greatest uh, cultural treasures. The painting remained in the Birmingham Library for many, many years. In fact, lots of uh, visitors to our museum have fond memories of uh, of visiting the painting um, while it was there or even working on their homework sitting beneath the painting. The painting was then transferred to the Birmingham Museum of Art in the late 80s and permanently given to our collection in 1991. Um, there are lots of rumors swirling about that the painting um, was not known to be a Bierstadt. In fact, when the painting was given to the Birmingham Public Library, it was given as a Bierstadt. Um, and it hung in the library um, consistently from 1929 until 1989, 60 years. I think over the course of time, as Bierstadt fell out of favor, and I should mention when this painting was sold for just $200 in 1929, that was before the stock market crash. It had nothing to do with the stock market crash. Paintings like this, um, in this style, were considered old hat. Um, remember that in 1913, this country had uh, the Armory Show in New York, which completely changed American tastes around art. And so these large uh, landscapes, I mean, one who could fit this uh, in their home, the, the mansions of the robber barons uh, were a thing of the past, uh, but two, this was considered old-fashioned, something someone's uh, grandparents uh, might have in 1929, and, and thus the reason for the, the nieces um, selling it, out with the old and in with the new. Um, so over time, I think people just forgot about Bierstadt, forgot about his legacy. Um, when the painting was transferred here uh, in 1989, um, it was realized rather quickly that it was a Bierstadt, um, but um, it just lived in our galleries quietly. Um, and that it was until the early 1990s when the National Gallery worked on its major Bierstadt exhibition, Art and Enterprise. This painting they had been unable to track down and there was one little shred of evidence that a curator there found that suggested maybe the painting had gone to Birmingham, Alabama. Um, on an on a off chance that that was the case, she called our registrar and uh, our registrar said, of course, it's hanging upstairs. What would you like to know about the painting? And so that is the moment when the painting sort of re-entered uh, the collective uh, record uh, in this country. And it's been a, a great hit ever since. It is one of the paintings that is most requested uh, for reproduction. We get uh, a numerous loan requests for the picture. Um, it, the study for the painting appeared on a U.S. posted stamp, and very proudly, a number of years ago, the National Endowment for the Humanities named this one of the 50 pictures that best tells America's story. So if that's not a, a nomination for national treasure, 
I don't know what is. But more importantly, this is a painting that is absolutely beloved uh, to the people of Birmingham. I've had countless visitors tell me um, that this is one of their favorite pictures, that they visit it often, and that they particular particularly visit it when they're having a difficult day. And so I hope that in these trying times that this picture, looking down the Yosemite Valley, California, can bring a light, little light into your lives and your homes. I hope you'll join me on Saturday at 2 p.m. Uh, when I discuss Sarah Miriam Peel's portraits, portrait of a jolly fat man, Dixon Hall Lewis. Uh, until then, wishing you all continued health, safety, and God bless. Signing out. Goodbye.